I know what you people are asking for. Late afternoon, let's talk some data. Yeah! Let's geek it out. Data, data, data. We hear about it everywhere. And it seems like data is what makes everything tick in the digital age. But what does data mean for the arts and cultural sector? How can policymakers incorporate the latest and most accurate information to better understand what's going on in America's creative communities? How can data help shed light on the role of the arts in everything from education to economic development to transportation? Today we are thrilled to be joined by some experts who will talk us through the dizzying intersection of information technology, policymaking, the music, and the arts. Please join us in welcoming Ian David Moss, Research Director of Fractured Atlas, Josh Geyer from the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities at the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, Stephen Schufeld, the Deputy Director at the Office of Research and Analysis at National Endowment of the Arts, our virtual panelist, who I, I am hoping and trusting is with us, awesome, Derek Slater, who's Policy Manager from Google, who's joined us from the Bay Area, and our moderator, Gene Cook, the Director of Programs, Future Music. Thanks. Enjoy. How are you guys feeling now? Yeah. I know we're getting to the point in the day when the panels start to look less like ways to learn more about the music industry and more barriers to your time at the bar. But we will try and be entertaining. And to the point, we've got some very knowledgeable panelists with us today. And uh, it's a pretty important conversation that we need to be having because ultimately, when we look at the future of our field, data is going to play a critical role. So, uh, first, uh, Derek, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Gene. Okay, cool. And those of you guys who are in the back, you could probably see him. He looks okay. He's in a good mood. All right, cool. Um, so we do have a great, uh, very distinguished panel. Maybe what we could do is we could start with Stephen. Uh, you can talk about what's been going on over at the NEA. Um, I think that initially we could just have everybody start by talking about the work that they're doing um, from their observations about, you know, how is data collected, about the arts community, how is it used. Um, if you want to talk about how it's evolved, that's cool too. But I am very curious, um, and I think it'll inform the panel conversation, if we hear from you about... Um, kind of data-related initiatives that you've been involved in so people can understand that the perspective that you're coming from. And then eventually, I think we also want to tie it to kind of the impact on public policy. So we'll start with Stephen. Great. Thanks, Gene. Hello, everybody out there. Um, so as Gene mentioned, I'm going to talk just for a few minutes here about some of the work that NEA's Office of Research and Analysis is doing and as relates to data. And uh, similar to the structure of our office, I think I'll actually talk about two, uh, two dimensions of data that we, we are connected to. Um, one is the, the side of our office that is focused on research, which is, has to do more with, I think, what, what, we, what, we mean, what we mean when we talk about big data is data out there in the world that we want to um, capture and use and figure out ways to uh, help us understand better um, the role of, of the arts in society. Um, and so that's, we do a lot of work there, both capturing data and, and uh, being involved in, in collecting data as well, and then figuring out how, how we can use it. Um, and then uh, on the other side of our office is uh, our evaluation, which is more internally focused and looking, focusing more on the work that NEA is doing as a funding agency and what is coming, uh, data to help us better understand what's coming of that kind of work. Um, and so just briefly on, and there, there are more projects than I have time to go into right now, so I'll just touch on a couple of, couple of the highlights uh, from each of those areas. But um, on, the, uh, on the outward focus it, uh, um, area, the research area, I would say one of the big uh, items that is sort of, a, a, we're just, uh, just beginning the process um, with the Bureau of Economic Analysis um, to, uh, develop a what's called a uh, satellite account that will uh, in the in the same way that the Bureau of Economic Bureau of Economic Analysis um, does estimates of GDP and that become the official estimates for um, all of all of policy making throughout the government uh, and they have what are called satellite accounts that estimate the uh, the contribution of particular sectors to GDP 
Well, through the hard work of uh, Sunil, who's the director of the Office of Research Analysis, and some of the other folks in our office, um, we've reached an agreement with BEA to uh, do an arts and culture satellite account. And so the purpose of that, and it's a contract that'll go over the course of several years, but they'll be basically figuring out ways to try and uh, estimate the role uh, or the contribution of arts and culture enterprises to, um, to the overall GDP, the overall economy. That's a big long-term project that uh, NEA is involved in and that's being led by BEA. Um, we also have a lot of work that we do, which is sort of in the data collection field. Uh, the most, uh, the, the one that's actually, we are expecting to get the new version of the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts in shortly, which is uh, a, a uh, data collection uh, supplement to the um, uh, current population survey that Census conducts. And it's, it's conducted every five years, uh, the, the supplement is, uh, which is a way of collecting information about how, how Americans participate in the arts. And, um, and so we've got a lot of work going on on that front uh, and some, uh, once we get the data, we'll be doing various kinds of analysis on that to try and help us understand that domain a little better. And then a, a, a third sort of area under this category is um, compiling information. This is something that's actually uh, Josh and I have uh, begun to work together a little bit on to help us better understand um, uh, in particular the activities we have under the creative placemaking um, rubric, which is uh, a big emphasis at NEA right now. And so we're working on projects that are designed to help us use existing data sources out there, things from census, things from um, uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, things from various others. I'm, I'm, I don't, don't remember them all off the top of my head, but um, various other data sources that we're going to use to help shed light on, well, our first phase is actually to help us better understand how those sources reflect the conditions that we think creative placemaking can have an impact on. So we've got a big project that we're undertaking right now in that domain. So that's just a snapshot of a couple of the different uh, activities we've got going on in the outward facing research domain. On the inf inside facing side, it's we, ha we are regularly and have been for years collecting data from all of the applicants um, to for NEA funds, both those who apply directly to NEA and those who apply to states that are receiving support from NEA. Um, so we've got a wealth of data that we collect from applicants and then from grantees at the conclusions of their reports. And we tr we're using that data and continuously working on improving our ability to use that data to help inform our grant making activities and help inform our understanding of the, the role NEA's grant making is playing uh, in, uh, in society. And sort of the uh, area that overlaps between those two is bringing together existing national level data sources and those kinds of local uh, NEA collected data as well to help us get a, a sort of an uh, uh, overlay two different kinds of data and help us better understand that. Um, so that's just a very quick overview and I'll stop there but I'm happy to answer more questions as we move along. Thank you. And I have to echo the, the fact that um, artist contribution to the economy is now being calculated as part of the GDP. I think it's a huge step and I was very, very happy to hear about that. I'm sure that all of you guys were psyched as well. If you hadn't heard the news um, before, maybe you're psyched right now. Um, I can see it in their eyes. I can see it in their eyes. I know they're all, they're all so excited. Um, <coughs> we're gonna it's totally not exhaustion. It's totally excitement. <laughs> we're going to skip over to Ian, actually, because what's interesting is kind of at the tail end of, of what Stephen was talking about. It's like taking different kinds of data sources and figuring out ways to kind of bring them together so you can learn uh, new things. Uh, about the data. Can you talk, and that's actually very relevant to the work that Fractured Atlas has been doing with the Archipelago Project, so maybe you could describe that for a minute. Sure, so um, Fractured Atlas is a, uh, for anybody who doesn't know Fractured Atlas, we're a national arts service organization with about um, 25,000 members uh, across the country. Um, we sometimes talk about ourselves as, uh, well, as uh, focusing on the, the unsexy infrastructure of the arts. Um, uh, and because we're very interested in uh, kind of how systems work and using technology um, to make those systems better. And so um, kind of 
uh, the, the sort of focus on research uh, sort of fits very naturally into that. Um, we are both an aggregator of data and a producer of, of data or a generator of data. Um, and the project that Gene was referring to is the aggregation piece of that. Um, it's called Archipelago. This is a, a software platform um, that we developed originally um, uh, in connection with a, um, a, a large private funder in the, the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and it is now uh, sort of in the process of being um, expanded and, and um, uh, rolled out to there's going to be a, sort of a free um, national version uh, that um, uh, and then also we're a part of a large collaboration with um, the Harvard Kennedy School um, on a project called the Initiative for Sustainable Arts in America. So um, what is Archipelago? It basically is a an experiment in trying to answer this very question, how is data collected about um, arts communities and used and what is out there. Um, we're trying to uh, sort of bring into one place every um, bit of information that we can uh, find that is uh, relevant to the cultural sector and available in some kind of replicable and uh, you know, sort of uh, a replicable way in this, in the sense that it is available in multiple geographies, and also that it is collected on a continual basis. Um, it turns out that the number of data sets that fit that description are relatively small. Um, you know, but we do we are able to bring into one place um, uh, information about uh, arts and culture nonprofits, um, both you know arts or arts organizations and what we call arts relevant organizations. Um, we have information on spaces. We have information on um, audience members through uh, mailing list collaboratives. Um, as well as uh, information from from the census and and um, you know to give context to all of this as well. Um, so this is uh, uh, basically the kind of the the beginnings of a project to um, to really sort of be able to see all of that in one place and and um, understand how regions, for example, are similar or different to each other. You know what is the the average uh, square footage per capita of rehearsal space, for example, in a um, in one city versus another or in one neighborhood versus the next one and you know is there um, an optimal sort of number that for that we don't we don't know the answer to that right now um, and uh, this could help us sort of along the way um, fractured atlas as I mentioned also has uh, data that it generates itself through its own programs um, one of those is uh, our art space solutions network um, which is the um, uh, sort of a set of aforementioned um, spaces, directories, and number of cities across the country, including New York, here in DC, um, at the San Francisco Bay Area, as I mentioned before. So each of these is a, a directory of venues and, and um, uh, information about them, and they're all kind of participating in this online marketplace where um, you know you can go and, and sort of book space, uh, and uh, so there's information available about the spaces, but then also about the activity that happens through that platform as well. Um, and then we also have the the nation's uh, largest fiscal sponsorship program, not just in the arts, but in any field. Um, and so we're just beginning to sort of mine the potential of that. Uh, data set. Um, it's really, you know, information about individual artists and this sort of under the radar arts projects um, are one of the, it's one of the hardest types of data to collect about the arts because there's no um, sort of defined um, as art artist population uh, that you can just put a box around and say like these are the artists who live in who live in the world, um, and so this this isn't that, but it gets us a little bit. It, it is a defined population that um, that is pretty large, and um, and we're able to we just recently sort of changed our reporting mechanisms to align more closely with um, something called the Cultural Data Project that a lot of nonprofits used, and we just published a study recently um, that. Uh, you know, looks at that in the case of New York City dance makers, um, and there's no reason that similar research couldn't be done for the music community as well. I believe with the Archipelago project, which is one of the first things that you and I talked about with respect to the Fractured Atlas research, um, that 
what's interesting about it is that you're able to juxtapose all of these different data sets, but also make it available to people who wanted to learn more about their communities. Mm -hmm. um, and in, including, um, in addition to the arts organization information and the other publicly available information, you were also considering putting in congressional districts and mm -hmm. putting in tools that would help people to increase their civic engagement around the arts and understand uh, the arts community in that way. Um, that, I think, is a, actually a good transition over to Derek, um, who we are going to turn to now. Can you guys see him? Is he showing up on the, the video yet? Okay. So uh, we're going to turn to Derek now and talk a actually a little bit about how data gets used um, uh, in the public policy debates, how does it inform policy making. Um, uh, obviously, this is something that you've spent a lot of time thinking about, and uh, I know that you've written about it as well. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah, happy to, Jean, and uh, thanks again for having me. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, so yeah, I, I work here on uh, Google's public policy team um, here in Mountain View, and one of the things we do here is a lot of research around the economic impact of the Internet, uh, including focusing on things like the arts, creativity, and its relationship to innovation. Um, and as we looked more and more about at the way innovation is currently measured, um, it was really striking to see that in many of the typical measurements of innovation, we're measuring the information society by industrial society metrics. That is, traditional measures of creativity have tended to focus on particular industry rather than content creation by individuals. And obviously today, when anyone can be a content creator, anyone can be an artist, lots of people are generating music and video online, uh, sort of the metrics of innovation and creativity have been an ill fit. Um, so one of the things we did uh, last year was work with the World Intellectual Property Organization uh, to contribute to their Global Innovation Index where they had typically measured creativity by things like the number of newspapers produced uh, and now have started to add on things like uh, the number of top-level domains, number of websites, number of Wikipedia edits, and uh, the number of YouTube uploads across countries. That's on the creator side. I think one of the other pieces um, that tends to be lost in public policy debates when looking at creativity and innovation are uh, metrics around consumer surplus and consumer gain. I think one of the great things that we see about the internet is that because there's such an abundance of creativity, oftentimes consumers are getting uh, great content in new and different ways and sometimes getting it even uh, cheaper or still legally but cheaper than they did before. Uh, and when that happens, that's a great thing for the economy. We saw last year in a report from uh, the Boston Consulting Group in Australia that the consumer surplus value of online creativity is around $24 billion. So no longer really a small number. And these are just sort of two, a couple of the ways that we think uh, when policymakers look at measuring creativity today, it's really important to take into account how creativity is changing. Was that a period or did you freeze up? Sorry, I froze up there, but <laughs> that can be a period. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have more to say, please, by all means, continue. Thanks, Gene. No, I think, uh, you know, it's especially important, I think, as we look towards, uh, you know, a new Congress next year that as, as sort of debates around copyright and culture continue to evolve, we really take a close look at how is creativity happening today? Because when we just look at traditional measures like record sales or newspapers produced or uh, ticket, uh, ticket sales, we're missing a big piece of the puzzle that's happening online. And it's not to say we should get rid of old metrics, just we need new complements that really take into account user-generated content and, and just the abundance of creativity. Thanks, Derek. Um, the idea, it's, it's really... Um quite a compelling idea to think about how the definition of creativity might change if you change the data sets that you're looking at. And one of the questions that I do want to ask the panel after uh, we talk to Josh for a second um, is about kind of how is it that you and each of your individual capacities decide which data sets are important and are interesting and are going to help you. Like in the case of Archipelago, there's a cost that's associated to including a data set into the larger program that you're building. So how do you determine uh, what's going to be useful and what isn't? But before we get to that, uh, I'd like to introduce Josh uh, Geyer. And uh, you're going to talk a little bit about some of the data that you've been collecting over at HUD. Thank you. Um, so I am, I am with the HUD Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities. Um, we do a, kind of a number of different things, but um, 
the, the biggest thing we do is we administer um, sustainable communities planning grants, which um, were given out in, um, in 2010 and 2011 to, I think, a total of 143 different um, local governments and regional governments and, and nonprofits uh, in order to um, do um, community planning or regional planning in a more integrated and efficient and um, engaged way. Um, we do a lot with data. Um, I think that the biggest things that data um, that data does for us um, are helping us to answer questions. Uh, first of all, um, what what is being produced by our, by our grantees? What are, what are they? What what is being produced um, as a result of the money that we've granted them? And um, secondly, what what are they accomplishing? Kind of kind of in, in a from a larger larger picture, um, are they accomplishing the kind of are, are they accomplishing things that move us closer to the goals of our program? So uh, our um, our grants are kind of based on um, a philosophy that is that is embodied by these six what we call livability principles, um, and to, to just summarize them, they are. Um, Increasing access to to, to housing, um, affordable housing, in, in housing different types of housing, increasing uh, access to transportation, um, uh, economic uh, recovery or vibrancy, uh, uh, um, valuing um, existing communities, i.e., pe the people who are living in in a place rather than people who might want to move there, um, uh, valuing. Um, Communities and neighborhoods, uh, which which is talking about the um, what the look and feel uh, and kind of the, the activity um, of a given place, um, and also um, coordinating uh, investments. Um, so I, I tell you this because um, we these are kind of really large questions, or they kind of pose really large questions, and it's our job in, in our use of data to try to answer those questions. Um, and so, um, really, it, the, 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 what we end up doing is looking at different existing data sources, most of which come from the federal government, but there are other sources as well, to try to um, codify, to, to, first of all, we have to, to codify what, what we think it would look at to, it would look like to um, increase the, the availability of housing, to increase uh, access to transportation. And then once we have, once we've done that, then we can look at um, the data sources that exist um, and, um, and see how, see if we can um, use them to measure, uh, to measure these, these things that we care about. And that's how we demonstrate the value that we're, we're getting for taxpayer dollars. Um, so in terms of, um, uh, in terms of how this reflects on the arts, um, I would say that um, my program is part of a larger um, place-based um, policy agenda uh, that the administration has um, that includes uh, programs like Choice Neighborhoods, Promise Neighborhoods, um, um, Strong Cities, Strong Communities, uh, and, a, and a, a number of other kind of programs which all have in common that they're trying, they try to, rather than have which particular, pick particular federal agency or federal program uh, focusing on that and, and that particular funding source, to look at where the funds are going in communities and in place um, and, and see how we can leverage those funds in order to, uh, in order to uh, have better outcomes. Um, so um, one way that I would I would say that um, that arts the arts are part of place they are part of what makes a place unique and they are part of what makes a place uh, uh, um, somewhere that people want to go. Um, so I brought I um, found a couple of examples of how the um, s uh, how people have used um, frameworks for measuring place that the arts could factor into. Um, one is um, there is a there's a study that's been uh, that's come out and an, and an additional one recently uh, on walkable urban places from the uh, the Brookings Institution. Um, you, some of you may have heard of it. it it's been uh, the, the lead author is Chris Leinberger. 
Uh, he's been talking a lot about this, these issues. Uh, and they are um, assessing um, these different walk, what's called walkable urban places um, uh, around the, the, the DC area according to several met metrics, one of which is walkability. And a couple, uh, there are 10 criteria for walkability that, that, they've, that they've laid out here. Two, two and a half of which I would say are, are very much uh, related to the arts or, or, or the, the arts could relate to. Um, one is aesthetics, so um, which they define as attractiveness, open views, outdoor dining, maintenance. So this is, these are qualities of the place. And also um, public spaces and parks, so playgrounds, plazas, playing fields. Um, so how, how might these things uh, um, contribute to the, uh, or relate to the arts? Well. Um, we feel that if, in order for art, in order to show that arts are contributing to economic activity, to vibrancy, to, to, be, to having a place be attractive, um, the, the places need to be, need to be ready to kind of have arts take, take their rightful place. Um, so we can look at the type of places that um, arts may, may be kind of on display or arts may be um, happening um, and, and see whether um, those might be places that we might want to have a focus on art or, um, or focus on different um, characteristics. And then the, the, the last, the other example that I found is um, from something called the, uh, the Star Community Index, or the Star Community Rating System. Um, uh, it's a ra the, the rating system. They're trying to rate the, the quality and the sustainability of communities or allow communities to do that for themselves. And they have seven different... Um, kind of goal areas. And one of them is education, arts, and community. And so um, they have, within the goal area of education, arts, and community, they have um, five objectives. Um, and they are um, arts and culture, providing a broad range of arts and cultural res resources um, that encourage participation and self-expression, community cohesion, um, edu educational opportunity at and attainment, uh, historic preservation, and social and cultural diversity. And uh, I think that the, if there are any lessons for the arts community, it, it's that um, uh, arts are kind of an integral part of how we're starting to think about um, quality of life and quality of place. And, and to the, the degree that they are integrated in the way that we're measuring quality of life and quality of place, we can, we can show how they fit in and the, the kind of value that have, having arts creates. So that's, that's, I guess that's what I would say about that. Thank you. I'm thinking about um, how in the case of uh, making the case about how creativity, the nature of creativity is changing. Um, you know, that's reflected in the SPPA. They've been changing some of the questions that they're asking, the survey for public participation in the arts. Now art making is one of the questions that they're getting deeper, um, deeper and deeper into in that area. Um, the idea of thinking about the arts as, as being tied to economic development. So these are, um, these are all themes that, we're he that I'm hearing throughout that are kind of connected. And I'm wondering how much of these themes becoming more prominent is kind of related to uh, the fact that the research exists now. Or is it that people wanted to explore those themes and then they started doing the research? This is kind of tied back also to the question that I was asking uh, earlier that I'm now going to circle back on, um, which is, is that like how do you figure out what data you're going to be working with? Um, I don't know if any of you want to jump in on that or if Derek wants to jump in uh, virtually. Good. Um, well, I think that this is, uh, this is an area where um, it's, it's a kind of a constant struggle, I think, for, for research in general, but especially for research in the arts because um, I feel like it's kind of a constant theme of, of my professional life that uh, the things that we would most like to know about are often the things that we don't have the data for. Um, and so, uh, and you mentioned earlier, Gene, that um, you know, when we're thinking about Archipelago, for example, there's, you know, there's a cost um, associated with any, you know, any given new data set that we want to include, you know, and sometimes that cost is very minimal and sometimes it might be quite, a, um, uh, quite large. And just as that's true for us, I mean, it's true for anybody. It's, you know, any kind of data set that you want to create, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, especially if you, if you want to be comprehensive about it and um, kind of have it uh, conform to 
um, you know, strong scientific standards, um, you know, the, the more, the, the sort of the higher standards you apply to it, the, the more that, um, you know, of a commitment that requires uh, from, uh, from whoever is sort of creating it. So, uh, so I think that there's kind of a, um, uh, you know, there, there's sort of different kinds of, of data. There's data that is, uh, is created specifically to answer a particular question. Um, and the advantage of that is like, and this is, we're talking about primary data collection here that might be through a survey. It might be through, um, you know, a, a, an evaluation that's tied specifically to one specific program that you're doing. The advantage to that is that it's super relevant. Um, you're going to, whatever questions you have, um, you're going to be able to, uh, get those answered and they will directly tie into decisions that you need to make and information that you need to make those decisions. So that's great. The downside of that is that it's the most expensive way to go. And it also is the, um, it's very hard to replicate that over time. Um, in a way that is, you know, is reliable. Then there's, um, you know, sort of making better use of data that already exists, um, and which is which is kind of what Archipelago is trying to do. Um, and then there's sort of this interesting third area of by data byproducts that are generated from, um, you know, from programs that are doing something else. Um, and but in the course of doing those things, they they generate this uh, kind of almost like exhaust stream of data that can you know maybe be useful to somebody else, and that's a really intriguing area that I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of in terms of the potential, um, because often the reason why it's part of the exhaust stream is because it's not useful to the organization that is generating that data, although it might be, um, but it may be much more useful to somebody else um, in sort of this broader ecosystem, and. I I think we're just starting to talk through the question of like how we form that those kinds of partnerships and networks and so forth to be able to benefit from each other's data that we're using, um, even if it wasn't the original purpose with which it was created. I'm kind of curious because we, we have the benefit of having people from different sectors mm -hmm. all on the same panel, but they all are interested in research and they're all interested in the cultural sector. Um, when While I can certainly vouch for the fact that um, research is very difficult and costly, uh, new data is really hard to come by in the nonprofit arts field, is that also the case um, for government agencies? Is that also the case for Google? Maybe I'll let Derek jump in. Is he still Huge on? Huge problem in this area. Can, sorry, did you hear me, Keen? We can hear you now. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I think um, I agree. I think it's a huge um, problem, in part because a lot of what we're trying to measure is like they're, they're counterfactuals. We don't know, we can't say what would have been created if policies were different. It's, and it's very hard to come up um, comparisons. Every once in a while, I think you get a sort of natural experiment in the field or some way to compare. Uh, different um, different countries and the way their sort of legal regimes or policy regimes have evolved. So, for instance, last year, uh, uh, Harvard Business School professor Josh Lerner did a study uh, comparing the growth of um, cloud computing in both the U.S. and Europe and found that certain parts of copyright case law played a really uh, important role in that, that field. Now, that's only because we had, he was only able to do that sort of data analysis um, because we happen to have this natural experiment where a certain case went down one way in the U.S., went a different way in Europe. Um, in the absence of those sort of natural experiments, it's very hard to come by. So it's, I mean, it's, I think it's a problem for everybody in this area. So we're almost out of time. I just wanted to get a sense. Do we have burning questions in the room? Because if we don't, I'm just going to ask a last question to the panel. We'll wrap up. I'm not seeing burning questions. So um, we do have about five minutes left. I'd love to just do kind of a lightning Oh, we have a burner. Hi, is there, um, is there someone with a microphone that can help this guy out? Mike Nelson with Bloomberg Government. Um, since we care a lot about data, I'll ask a data question. What one data set would you really like to have? Oh my God, that was gonna be my question. <laughs> Brilliant people. <laughs> so we'll do a lightning round. We'll go through each of the panelists. We'll start with Steven. I don't think my answer will change that much long. I think about it longer. Um, I think uh, uh, something that we would love to have in our office and that we're, in fact, um, exploring how to do so through Google 
Um, so hello, Derek. It's nice to meet you virtually. Um, and it actually, I think, is a fourth category of, of data that's out there, um, but getting it in a, in a way that we think is reliable is a measure of, uh, a, a way to measure the level of arts activity in locations across the country. Um, and that's a very, that's a broad answer to a specific question, but um, there would be nuances in there. So like a place-based understanding of arts activity? Yeah, and I should, yeah, that's, that's what I think would be really great to have. Okay, great. Um, Shelly? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> I was um, looking at your name tag. It says Shelly right in front of you. It's like Josh. So I'm I'm actually I'm uh, sitting on this panel for my boss, Shelly Paticha. So all of my stuff says Shelly Paticha, but I am actually Josh Geyer. Um, so um, I'm actually um, w one of the things that I do is I, I'm working on generating a data set on um, the combined cost of housing and transportation at the neighborhood level um, across the United States. Um, so, but it's something that I would be really, really um, interested in if there were some if there were a, a uniform um, universal database on pedestrian access that would be enormously helpful because that that is something that varies not only between communities but within communities and it has an enormous impact on people's daily lives um, particularly people who who are at a disadvantage either because they're they're physically disabled or um, they had they had don't have access to, to different uh, to set types of transportation, I think that would that would be transformative. Ian, and then we'll let Derek have the last word. Okay. Well, um, uh, as far as data sets, I, I think I'd agree with um, with Stephen. I think uh, uh, events is probably the um, the category of um, data in the arts world, anyway, that offers um, the most promise, and yet it's most frustrating because it's it's completely decentralized. There's tons of data that exists about events, but it's not all in one place. It's not standardized. Um, I know there are some folks in the field who are working on that at the moment. But actually, what excites me the most, I'm I'm sort of ten tempted to be contrarian a little bit and and say that I, what I would love would be to have um, a uh, not a data set, but a, a set of good questions. So um, basically, you know, and actually there, there's a, a group called GiveWell um, that focuses on like international like, aid giving and so forth. And they've actually proposed the idea of creating uh, something called a journal of good questions um, that would essentially focus on, you know, what are, what are the things that we wish we knew about but didn't? Not focusing on data set specifically, but, you know, like... Um, it, like what are the what are the factors in in you know creative placemaking that um, make a project more likely to be successful over another? Like you know, does it matter if the project is um, using a storefront space or not? For example, um, you know, and you could think of a million like that. Um, and uh, and I think if that if we had um, you know one sort of central place to access all of those, that would be really powerful. Derek. Yeah, I think um, you know it's it's both a, a set of data and a type of analysis that I'm interested in. Don't have not had good answers for, which is um, trying to understand the economic value of user generated content that's being created today. I think if you look at the direct GDP contributions of Wikipedia, well, you come up with zero. Obviously, it's not producing revenue. Um, it's not selling anything, but. lives adds to productivity and so on. Um, I think that's that's a tough measurement and economics problem, but I'm, I'm sure somebody far smarter than I am could, could figure it out. I hope they do. Okay, and then I guess I lied because maybe I'll have the last word since yeah. I'm the moderator of the panel. Um, you know, we, Ian and I've been talking a lot about data kind of cross sector, and we know a lot of researchers who are working in a lot of different areas and using different methods to try and understand the arts community. Um, I would love just a list of all the research that exists in our sector. Because it's like, it's a nascent sector, there isn't a whole lot of work that's been done in it, and it's really hard sometimes to map out, well, who actually has been doing work on individual artists, or who actually has been doing work on like kind of place-based um, examinations, and things like that. So that would be mine. Please give a very warm round of applause to our wonderful panelists. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, I guess the next person's coming up. <laughs>